Welcome to Midweek Talks, where we help you follow Jesus and answer your questions in the middle of personal, social, cultural, political, or whatever issues there might be. I'm your host tonight, Mark Ivey. Let me get you to share this because we're going to have a relevant discussion tonight about race and Jesus in America. Our guest this evening is Lawrence Williams. Lawrence, uh, I'm delighted to have you back tonight. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. I want to establish something right now before we uh, move any further. You and I are actually friends. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> we actually like each other. Right, yes, yes, true. Yeah. Um, and uh, our relationship goes back uh, a number of years. 10, 15 at least. Yeah. Yes. And you and I have had discussions about this matter of race in America, yep. in the church, uh, personally, corporately, publicly. Yep. And uh, I just want to establish that because uh, some people watching this might think that, um, well, I just had some guy come in to talk to uh, and have some sort of discussion that we didn't have any background, didn't have any relationship. And uh, you, uh, uh, pastor over in Mooresville. Correct, yes. Uh, You're married with uh, two children, is that right? Two girls. Two girls. Yes, yes. And... uh, We've talked about some of this before, but as an introduction tonight, I want to go back for just a moment. And uh, it was so interesting when you shared with us some of your background growing up uh, Mm -hmm. in New York. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And can you just talk to us a minute about some of that background growing up that will help us to to jumpstart where we're going tonight? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, So, yeah, so again, thanks for having me here. And... uh, um, yeah, I, I grew up in New York City, uh, Queens, New York, and um, I grew up in uh, the 80s where um, there was a lot of, I think, you know, racial tension that uh, we grew up experiencing. I'm going to pause you right there. We're going to come yeah. back to it. Yeah, yeah. Where there was a lot of racial tension <laughs> as though, like, we're not there yeah. right now, right? Yeah, okay. yeah, okay. yeah. Was, wasn't that yeah. I left. Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> right. So it's only okay. grown from that yeah, point. Okay. Yeah. Um, but... Yeah, it, you know, it's just one of those, um, uh, it, I grew up in an era where um, being a, a black man in Queens, uh, I was really made aware at an early age uh, about how you carry yourself, how you interact, because, you know, there's, there's all sorts of things you have to be aware of and concerned about. Such as? Uh, oh, yeah, such as things that I would say are, are minor um, in retrospect, like walking around in a store and being followed around because there's an assumption that you may steal something, right? <laughs> because you're black to major things such as the talk. As yeah. you get behind the wheel of a car, if you ever get pulled over by police, you have to make sure you execute that whole uh, situation well or else, you know, you may end up dead. I mean, so everything in between. So let me ask you, for somebody watching, mm-hmm. that's a just a perception you have, Lawrence. <laughs> You're paranoid. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not reality. Yeah. So what do you say to somebody that just shakes her head and say, I never got uh, followed in a store. Yeah. I'm not worried about getting um, stopped by a police officer. Because if you look at some things now, mm-hmm. I say, if you would just comply, mm. nothing bad would happen. You're right. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. I think the reality is, you know, well, one, when you grow up and um, every family gathering and interaction, mm. everybody has like five different stories of the interactions they've had. That kind of shapes your reality. When you look at the statistics and quite honestly, the amount of times that, you know, blacks are pulled over and, and ultimately end up in these adverse situations, it also lets you know that there's more than just the the hype around it. And then when you have your personal, you know, story to tie to it and you acknowledge that, you know, you've seen these things, it, it really makes it crystal in your mind that yeah, this is this is these are some real things that we wrestle with. So I think I remember you telling me about you and a group of guys getting pulled over one evening. Yes, okay. yes. Can yes. you kind of yes. refresh my memory on that? Oh my gosh. This was the one uh, experience that really helped put things in perspective for me for a number of reasons. Um, first, 
it was myself and three other guys. We were coming from a church basketball league. Um, I had actually coordinated this, um, and we had uh, were having a great time just with each other, heading back home, and uh, sitting at a stoplight. Um, police uh, car pulls up next to us, cuts on the siren, cuts on the lights, says pull over. Right? We all pull over. Everybody out of the car, bags on the you know car, hands on the car, and the person. What were you doing? I know you weren't doing anything. Yeah. But what was the perception that you were doing something? You sitting at a stoplight. We were sitting at a stoplight. Okay. And and this is the part that was so uh, challenging um, because um, my entire life, you know, being made aware that you have to be careful of different situations and who you hang out with, and growing up in the church and trying to make sure that I did not put myself in bad situations. This particular situation. In my mind, I, I had the same question, why? <laughs> what are we doing wrong? And, um, you know, I'm in the whole comply. You know, you can always, you know, argue stuff later. But uh, the driver of the car who was, um, I guess he was about 19 at the time, he was really frustrated and agitated and saying, hey, why did you pull us over? The cop just said, listen, just, you know, let's, let me see your bag. You know, put your hands on the car. Don't ask any questions. And the more he was... At, you know, asking the question and not getting any answer, the more agitated things got. And that's what really put things in perspective for me in that depending on how this situation went, right, it could have went bad for all of us. And so that really was one of those, I think, um, foundational experiences, if you will, that kind of helped to put all of those stories and everything else I had heard in perspective when I had my own experience that really gave me that perception that hey, being black in Queens, is a, is, there, there can be challenges with that. Do you think that some of those perceptions were enhanced by family discussions that made it worse than it really was, or was it reality? I, I think it was reality. I, I really do. Um, again, I think that, and back then I was not a person to look at the statistics of it. Since then I've looked at data and, and I've said, okay, this kind of confirms a lot of the um, experiences that I've heard and, and experienced, but I, I think it's real. Um, now, that being said, I do know that having a negative mindset or a controversial, uh, you know, confrontational mindset when you get in those situations can take a situation that doesn't have to be as bad and can make it worse. But um, I do have to keep that in mind that, you know, how you, how you interact and how you, what sort of uh, assumptions you bring to that interaction could change the outcome. Do you think that the family situations, uh, and these, this is proven out by statistics, mm -hmm. of fatherlessness in Af African American homes has really contributed and, and not helped this matter because there's no male model many times. I, clearly, uh, the statistics uh, support that. With fathers not being in the home, you're much more likely, right, to end up, you know, every negative, you know, metric you can uh, think of, you'll, you'll experience, whether it be uh, in, in prison or economically challenged, educationally, you name it. Um, but, you know, one of the things that I realized, too, is uh, that is one metric in the middle of many that kind of uh, help to shape a narrative and, and shape a situation. Um, and there's lots of factors that contribute to that, but for sure, that does not help the situation. Yeah. So you're obviously not in Queens anymore. Huh? Correct, correct, uh, correct. So when did you make the transition? I don't mean moving out, per se, mm -hmm. from the location. When and how did you make the transition in your mind? Mm -hmm. Because you're, you're working in the corporate world. Yes. Um, you're educated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yep. You grew up among those who had the same, not necessarily the same opportunity, but the same privilege to be able to do something different. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So where did the mindset change come yeah. for you that you weren't going to be in, in Queens the rest of your life? Nothing wrong, wrong with Queens, but right, I mean, right. standing on the corner complaining about the way life is instead of doing something about right, it. Right. So I was extremely blessed uh, in that I had uh, both parents in the home. My dad mm -hmm. now... While he was not a Christian for most of his life, he, he came home most nights. He worked, you know, every day, uh, had no problem disciplining us and, and everything. Mom was in the church. And so uh, fundamentally, I would say coming up, 
I had this perspective that you're different and not just because you're black, but you're different as a Christian, as a Christ follower. That's in fact how I define myself at my core. I am a Christian first who happens to be black and, ha and a male, right? And I can't lose sight of those realities, but they can't overtake the fact that at, the, at, the, at my core, you know, I've got to follow Christ's law. And so I think that's what helped me to navigate a lot of these situations and not um, just take a negative uh, perspective on things and, and try to look for the, the opportunities and, and, and things like that. Well, let's talk about that for a minute because doesn't or isn't Christianity supposed to trump feelings, uh, overrule um, actions? Uh, aren't Christians supposed to be living in a life of forgiveness, mm -hmm. not offense? Right. So what do you say to those believers who are African American that, for instance, uh, think that there should be reparations, let's say, mm -hmm. for errors three or four or five hundred years ago, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or who are still fighting a battle that maybe is not theirs to fight, mm -hmm. um, or where does, where does Christianity and where, where, where does Jesus and race come together? Because there should be a place where we're able to say to um, any ethnic group, Mm -hmm. uh, African American, Latino, Hmong, Indian, white, mm -hmm. whatever it is, that you should be walking in a level of forgiveness and not always be demanding something more mm. based upon what happened 100, 200 years ago. Does that make sense? It, it does. Now, th th there's a lot there, but I, I'll say this. One is, um, I think, I had a pastor one time say to me that if everyone acted like Jesus, we'd have a whole lot less problems or something to that effect, right? And I, think, and I think fundamentally that is true. Uh, the reality is we're all human, we all sure. live in the flesh, and we all yeah. have, you know, um, things we deal with. Um, so I think, one, when it comes to being black in America, and, and, and I'll just, I'll take myself as an example. Um, yeah, I, I try to approach every situation with that same mindset, mm -hmm. that I'm a Christian first, you know, black man second, or, you know, father, and, you know, I don't want to get yeah. into the order American of each third. one. <laughs> American third. Yeah. all of that yeah. stuff, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't take away the fact that uh, I am a black man, and there are situations that happen and things that impact me um, that need to be addressed. Now, how they're addressed, right, and, and everything else, I think, is, a, is an issue. But I think the reality is... Um, you know, the love of Christ it puts me in a position where I try to ask questions like, you know, what would Jesus do, right? And how would he interact in situations like this? And um, how, can, how can I interact in the same way? But then at the same time, uh, you know, in t bring in kingdom principles to influence the environment around me. Yeah. So I think it's more than the individual's um, I'd say black people as a whole just saying, hey, if we acted Christ like that would change it because the reality is there's a lot of issues that cause complications and problems with sure. that. Right? Well, not just African Americans acting Christians, maybe the rest of us acting that way Every, too. Exactly, everybody, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, the, sometimes the confusion for me, honestly, is I was brought up in the state of Maine, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay? And I was not brought up with what sometimes we refer to as a prejudicial mindset. Mm. Uh, and I know that word can mean a lot of things. Right, right. Okay? And we talked right. about it a minute ago. It's, right, it's, right. Maybe it's prejudice or maybe it's bias mm -hmm. or, or mm -hmm. something else. Mm -hmm. And it was confusing to me mm. when I came south. Yep. I thought, why is there, because it wasn't where I lived really. And of course, you know, somebody watching right now and say, well, you didn't grow up with a lot of African Americans. No, that's true. Mm -hmm. But it didn't matter mm -hmm. because to us, right. the color or ethnicity of somebody mm -hmm. to us was irrelevant. Right. Uh, and so that when I came south and particularly started going to school uh, in a far southern state, um, 
it was confusing to me some mm -hmm. of the perceptions. Right, right. Um, because I didn't grow up like that. Right. And did not have a predisposition per se mm -hmm. um, toward that. Do you think that some of the ethnic predispositions of some Americans um, is cultural mm -hmm. based upon how they were raised mm -hmm. um, or where they lived at? Yeah, no, I think that everybody is a product of the culture that, that you came out of, for sure. Um, and I'll, I'll say this, that um, the, the interaction you and I have, and it, you know, goes back again 15 years when we first started our church. And I remember talking to uh, a member at your church at the time who just found out we were both ministers at the time. And then we started hanging out and doing lunch and all. And the interactions we had um, allowed me to help, un help, help me to understand that um, just because I'm black, just because you're white, doesn't mean we, we gotta have a conflict. We can work together. I mean, you've helped us tremendously um, over the years and that's helped me to, to see your heart. Um, and I think part of, the, part of that Maybe because of the culture you came from that made you open, you know, and not have, you know, uh, barriers and walls. I, I know me coming from Queens, I came up with some barriers and walls, right? Um, but I will say that even in that context, there's a culture that we live in, right, that has, that brings different messages and, and, and uh, brings in different uh, challenges that we have to navigate, you know, even through uh, our relationship, right? In the sense that um, when, if you're in an environment where um, there's, I got, a, I got an example, this is maybe a bad example, but I have a friend who lives in the area who was running for an office, uh, a public elected office, we'll get into the specifics. Um, African American lives in, in the town and he was telling me that uh, some of his personal experiences, he was really attacked because mm. of his race. Mm. Um, and he explained- Of course, the race card is used a lot. It's, it's used a lot. By, by whoever. It, it, it is. When people use the N-word, put it on your lawn, right? Yeah, okay, <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. That's yeah. where I say, okay, that was probably a legitimate thing. Yeah. He's yeah. a pastor as well. Yeah, okay. All right, and, yeah. and he lives in, in this county, in this area, mm. and so, you know, the reality is, you know, within even in the culture, uh, you know, there are things we, we still have to navigate, mm -hmm. right? And, and recognize that that doesn't define everyone, but it does make you conscious of there are people and cultural issues that still impact relationships, if that makes any sense. Yeah, know. and of course, and anybody's gonna run for political office. Yeah. Uh, just, <laughs> <laughs> evidently, everything yeah. is fair game anymore. Yeah, it's, it's intense. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about some of this yeah. terminology. Yes, yes. Um, that we hear in America and have heard maybe the last three or four years, right. and particularly right now. Right. Okay, systemic racism. Yes. Um, how do you perceive that? Yeah. So, um, yeah, let's, it, in terms of terms, right, there's bias, and we, we all have biases, right? I have biases against anchovies, right? Yeah, I've never right, met yeah, an anchovy yeah. I like, regardless. Neither <laughs> mind. <laughs> Just, you know, so we all have biases. Some, some of those are based on, um, if nothing else, what we've watched on television, right? Sure. Um, prejudice, I think, is a, is a different, um, is a different level of, not only do I have a bias, I'm kind of against, you know, something. And I think there's something that you, um, you know, just a different level of, of bias, right? Um, but then when we talk about discrimination, it's when we take action, right? And so if okay. you think about systemic racism, um, it's really this, this concept that there has been action taken, um, you know, against a group or groups of people um, across multiple systems that create this culture, this environment, right, that makes things uh, more challenging to, to people of different races. And I can talk specifically from the black culture sure. just because I, I tend to be more familiar with that. that. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so when I think about that term, though, yeah. um, I, I hear it said that multiple organizations within their founding, their systems, their structure, yeah. their leadership, um, there's just systemic racism all over the place. And I take a look at our organization here, mm -hmm. and I say, 
doesn't it have more to do, because that's not here, mm. doesn't that have more to do with le who's leading an organization than it does have to do with any organization itself? Uh, say more about that. You mean like... Yeah, uh, so when we say there's general sis systemic racism, mm -hmm. is that really the case, or is it the leaders in certain organizations uh, that have okay. created that atmosphere? Because we don't have that here. Okay, okay. Uh, and I'm thinking... We don't have it here because we haven't allowed it here. Okay, okay. Okay, and, and to blanket a term and say every organization is systemically racist, yeah. I'm like, yeah. how could that be? Doesn't that come from the leadership, I depending on who's in charge, versus any organization yeah. is automatically systemic, systemically racist? Right, got it. Um, one of the reasons my wife and I have been married as long as we have is we've, we've made a rule early on to anytime someone exaggerates, we call them on it, right? So okay, anytime yeah, you okay, use the word yeah. every, any, all, yeah, okay, right? right yeah. And so yeah. I agree that any anytime you say any and every group, and you know, they're systemic everywhere, I think that's always an mm -hmm. exaggeration. Um, I think you're, you, you point to an interesting um, issue, which is culture does reflect leadership, right? It's, it's yeah. more personalities that form that culture and, and the like. Um, but I think the, the term, as, as I understand it, systemic, systemic racism is not necessarily, I, I guess in some cases it could be, but when I, when I hear it, it's not necessarily just one organization that is an issue, but it's more, are there systems that when you look across them, you see certain disparities that are consistently across. But you know, it's possible, I think, for an institution or, or a company or, or a business to not be systemically racist, but still work within a society that has systemic racism, if that makes sense. So it would be your understanding that there um, has been less opportunity for African Americans than there have, in some cases, mm -hmm. than there have been for other individuals. Yes, and I mean, let's, let's, let's take it off of African Americans for a minute, because I was thinking about this on the way over here, and just think about like women as an example. Mm -hmm. So if women are, you know, roughly half of society percentage wise, roughly, um, but when you look at like corporate America, there's like 4% of women that are CEOs, right? right mm -hmm. So if you look at that number and that disparity, you'd say if there's 50% that are alive, <laughs> you know, and available, mm -hmm. and then you talk about how many are in the workforce and in CEOs, that would tell you there's something there that has caused that to happen. And it's not just one company, right? It's across, you know, so many that you'd say, hey, systematically, we'd have to maybe look at this a little deeper. And I think when we, we talk about systemic racism, I think we, that's, the, that's the same way I would look at it, to say if as African Americans were 12 percent of the population, then, you know, are we represented equally throughout different aspects? And if not, what are their drivers, reasons, issues? You know, like yeah, so take women, for instance, though. Yeah. Are some of them not in those positions because they've chosen to have children? Yes, uh, I'm sure that's Less part than, of yes. you know, uh, less than men, obviously. Yes. <laughs> uh, yep. Because uh, they're pregnant, they're going to have children, they're yep. going to spend time raising kids. Maybe they feel, you know what, I'm going to give up my corporate life. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, understood. And, uh, yep. yep. Uh, and no, I, I think that yeah. that's true. Um, and but when I look at four percent versus fifty, right, or forty nine point, okay. you know, I'm. <laughs> you're thinking maybe forty six percent maybe didn't decide to stay home and raise kids. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. Now you know, I, but I mean that's just one example that when you when you see the the delta that big, it just causes you to ask the question. You know, what's what's driving that? Right. So. So, let's talk about what's happening right now. Yes. We've just been through the tr trial of George Floyd. Uh, Derek Chauvin, yeah. Uh, yes, with yep. Derek Chauvin, yep. yeah. Yep. And, and uh, nobody would deny that mm. an injustice was done there. Right. Uh, I, I think that's, that's uh, obvious. Mm -hmm. Why do you think when the, the George Floyd incident first occurred, why do you think that such a reaction, mm. particularly in Minneapolis and then in other parts mm. of, of the country, 
did it justify burning a city down mm. before there was even an opportunity for justice to be served? Mm. Um, why do you think there was such a, uh, like a rubber band action, boom, and yep. suddenly we're, yep. and we've got multiple cities in America that are rioting and other things. Why, why do you think that occurred yeah. without even the justice system even having a chance to do yeah. its work? Yeah. Well, I think, to, I love the rubber band um, analogy. So the mechanical engineer in me starts thinking about, okay, when you pull a rubber band back, right, you, you're putting in some energy, right, that you're building up so that when you finally release it, all the energy you, you right. put in just causes it to fly. Um, I'm convinced that um, every state in America had a, a demonstration, by the way, after that. Uh, yes. And, I mean, and I'm, I'm convinced that... We had one here in Newton. Um, yes, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. But no, no buildings were burned up. No, no okay. buildings burned up. No, <laughs> okay. no, I was at it for, the, for <laughs> most you. of the time. Yeah. I, yeah, we didn't have any burned in Mooresville as well. Right, yeah. good. But no, I, I think um, the reality is the, the, when he was murdered, it was not... A, just a one-time thing that people just flew off the handle by. I think it was so many other things that have taken place. I mean, if you think about like Philando Castile, uh, Sandra Bland, you think, I mean, it, there's, there's a list, Michael Brown, all okay. of these different instances where there were these, these killings, typically unarmed black men by police that no charges are ever filed and anything else. Mm. I think there was, that contributed to all of this energy. And when George Floyd was killed, I think the difference here was a couple things. One, that had to be the most filmed murder in the history <laughs> of right. death, yeah. right? Yeah. And so everybody saw what, what ended up being, I guess, nine minutes and 29 seconds mm -hmm. over and over, in addition to the fact that, you know, you had all of this tension before and um, that and everybody was home from COVID. <laughs> watching sure, that that didn't help matters. <laughs> yeah. Everybody was stressed. But mm -hmm. I, think, I think all of that had some contribution to the fact that people really demonstrated in non-godly ways, right? And there's never a reason to justify burning down a city and you, yeah. you don't do that. And I've always wondered um, if, if I were not a Christian, and I were so angry that I wasn't going to burn a building down, I wouldn't do it in my neighborhood. Anyway, but, um, <laughs> you know, and I, and I think there's some bad actors in, in those sure. that took there advantage are. of situations. Yeah. But, I, but I think the, the energy was largely because of a lot of the things that have happened over the past, quite honestly. It, it feels like yeah. that America has been having this discussion for a long time. Yes, yes. Um, and if we go back to the influence of Dr. Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and some of the important mm -hmm. uh, work that Dr. King did. Yep. <laughs> and of course, I was born in 1961, okay? So that's mm -hmm. around some of those mm -hmm. times and I'm not old enough to even know anything going on, right? Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't feel like we have made a lot of progress. Mm, mm. Now, we may have made more than, but, but I've lived, you know, through this in the 60s, then the 70s, and the 80s, and the 90s, and the, and the 2000s, and now in 2021. It feels like we're, we're going around the same yeah. uh, circle, mm -hmm. circling the same mountain. Yeah. Uh, why do you think that is? Wow. Um, sin. <laughs> yeah, okay. okay. Good answer. <laughs> yeah, I think sin is at the root of it. Um, you know, we, we started uh, an initiative in Mooresville after the, the George Floyd yeah. you know, murder called the uh, Three Conversations. So we intentionally reached out to predominantly white churches, predominantly black churches, and we got together and we said, hey guys, if there's anybody that should have an answer to this. It, sure. has, it has to be us, yeah. right? If those yeah. of us who are Christians, who we believe that when we go to heaven, there won't be the black section, the white section, the, right. the Latino section. And right. if we can love openly, we can come together around these initiatives and, and just demonstrate the love of Christ, that can have an influence and, and show you know, everybody else how, how to get past this and how to deal with the sin issue. Um, but I'll be honest, it, that was hard. 
Um, and I and I believe in my heart that all of the pastors that were in the room had were completely on board and engaged. But some of the pastors came in and said, "My congregation is giving me problems." Mm. There was there was one pastor who said to me that she got in her pulpit and preached about the love of Christ and how we have to you know. Yes. And, and put some practical application, to, you know, about racism, racism and hatred and, and love and everything else. She said that at the end of her sermon, one of the members of her church came to her and said, I don't have to listen to or put up with this liberal BS and didn't use the letters yeah, yeah. BS. And I, my eyes were so big because, um, and she was trying to explain that it was hard and taking a stand saying that we should love each other yeah. because there's such... Uh, built in animosity around anything that seems like, I don't know, it just conflicts with some people's beliefs. But that, that was, I, I think a reason why, honestly, we, we struggle with sin is just so deeply ingrained that, that it's hard to, um, to, to expose and, and really get to the root of. I do think that we have not done well listening to each other. Correct, I agree. Uh, we yell a lot at each other, but we don't listen. Yes. Um, and if anybody should be listening, it's those that, you know, say they have a relationship with Jesus. Yes, yes. If I'm transparent, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and why wouldn't that be right? Uh, one of the frustrating things for me is to be labeled as something that I'm not. Mm. And, and, and you would feel the same way as well and to be placed under an umbrella of because I happen to be white, mm -hmm. that this is how I think. Right, right, okay? right. And it appears to me that there is an attempt at a narrative in America right now mm -hmm. to uh, make us all feel guilty mm, mm -hmm. yep. because of our specific race or that somehow you're white, well, you're a white supremacist, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, right. right? And so we use all this, this uh, fiery language yeah. that just lights the fire more, right? right? Absolutely. Um, and I personally, and refusing to be labeled that way because that's not how now there are some I'm sure that are like that right um, I I don't feel that way mm -hmm. um, so as it relates to what appears and, and maybe my perception is wrong and so I need your help here okay a narrative or a movement in America that says we have an opportunity to now to justify the last 200 years of of woundedness let's do it mm. um and so the labeling begins mm. and there's a move for instance uh in the school systems um to teach critical race theory for instance mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and recreate america let's take away Let's take out the bad parts of America, for instance, that have happened. Let's tear down statues. Let's, let's, let's right. not yeah. let our future kids know that we had a bad time in America. Right. We, we fought a, uh, a civil war right. Right. Um, over some of these, right. these things. Right. Right. Um, and, you know, I think not physically, well, in some ways, yes, in physically. Some ways, yeah. <laughs> We're in another civil war here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so as an African-American Ameri African yeah. man, mm -hmm. what do you say to a lily white guy <laughs> who can't hardly even tan in the summertime, okay? <laughs> um, I, if I'm gonna tan, I have to go to a tanning, <laughs> uh, spray tan to get it dark, <laughs> right? Okay. Um, what do you say to a, a white guy? I don't have guy? an answer for that. Okay, oh, okay, okay, I'm yeah, sorry. okay, yeah, yeah, yeah right. No, I can't, I, yeah, right, okay. <laughs> Um, what do you say to a white guy that's standing back here and saying, you want me to fall under a narrative. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm not going to. Yeah. Whether it's a, in, in much of the time it's yeah. a political narrative. Right, okay? right, 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 um, right. And, uh, but oftentimes it is a religious slash yep. spiritual narrative. Mm, 
um, that uh, the spiritual thing to do is lean into it mm -hmm. and just admit your guilt. <laughs> just admit you're guilty, right? Yeah. Um, and, and we're all guilty for something. Right. Okay. What do you say to a yeah. white guy? Yeah. And, and those that are watching, they're, they're shaking their heads saying, yeah. this is not who I am. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So first, first, let me say this. Um, thank you for this conversation. I, I think the, the only way we can uh, really make headway in issues is, is conversation. One of the first things you said is we're not talking to each other. We're yelling, right? And I right, think, yeah. I think yeah, that's right. clearly... Uh, a problem. I think the only way to really learn and to, to, to understand where people are is to talk. Um, secondly, um, you know, when it comes to the history and things like that, um, I a uh, couple a couple of thoughts. One, my dad. I talked about him earlier. He's yeah. he uh, most of his life was not a Christian. He, he drank. He hung out. He didn't come home every night. Right. Yeah. Um, he uh, lived a pretty rough life. Mm -hmm. As uh, for the last five to ten years of his life he accepted Christ and yeah. and um, you know I had already been an adult at the time but I will tell you that knowing my dad's history there's a lot of things that I'm not proud about sure uh, but I, understanding that helps me to understand how he became who he was and it helped me to love him even more sure. recognizing some of the ways that he was raised and the issues he had to overcome and so I think you know the area of history I, I'm not a fan of tearing down statues I'm not a fan of trying to, you know, rewrite. You can't rewrite history. Yeah. History is history. I think you have to understand it. You got to embrace it. Well, at least understand it and say, this is where, how we got to where we are. So now, going forward, how do we not repeat history? Right. You know, yeah. and I was right. never a big fan of history. I used to think, didn't that happen already? Why are we talking about mm -hmm. it? Yeah. But it's interesting when you look at it to see where we are now, you can kind of see patterns and then sure. hopefully, you know, ways we can maybe short circuit. And my thinking that. is if you don't understand history, mm -hmm. you, you can't start where you're at. Exactly. And if you don't understand history, right. you're going to end up making the same errors Absolutely. and mistakes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like when you go to your doctor, right? First thing they want to do is talk about your parents. Family history. And I'm yeah. like, I just want to talk about my problem. And they're like, right, yeah, yeah, we're talking about your problem starting yeah. with the history. Yeah. And I think, yeah, that's, that's the only way I think we can start the dialogue. Um, but then also recognizing that my dad did that. <laughs> I didn't do that, right? Mm -hmm. So and to your point about blame and things like that, that that's one thing I don't, I, I'm adamantly against. Um, you didn't own slaves. Um, right. I, you didn't, right? No, okay. I didn't know. No, <laughs> no, I didn't know. <laughs> I mean, you know, so. I mean, my kids might say <laughs> that I did, okay? But no, we did not. <laughs> right. So I, I'm, I'm a big fan of, you know, um, acknowledging, you know, wh where we came from in the past doesn't um, necessarily mean blame. You shouldn't, you can't be responsible for something you did not do, right? right. It gives us an understanding of kind of where we are, but more importantly, I think, um, you know, again, the other thing is, um, you, you said something that really triggered the thought too, is just the labels, right? Yeah. And, and things like that. I, I preached a, a series called The Cross and the Flag. And I was trying to emphasize this point that Jesus, if he was you know, physically walking the earth now, I don't think he would be a Democrat or a Republican. Hmm. Um, the cross is higher than the flag. I think it's higher than you know, either side of the aisle. And you realize that statement among even many Southern Bible Belt Christians is mm -hmm. controversial. Well, and that's kind of where I'm going with yeah. this. And uh, good thing this isn't airing live, so nobody knows what I'm leaving yeah, the okay, building. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> but I, one of the problems I had, because I still do my own graphics. We're, we're not at your yeah. level, man. I still have to do my own work. <laughs> I couldn't do it. I'd be lost. <laughs> I'd have to go copy and paste. <laughs> well, that's kind of what I was doing. Yeah, okay, I, was, yeah, okay, I, was, yeah. I literally went on Google and I typed in cross and flag. Yeah. And I was trying to find some images that I could use and just kind of for our series. And I could not find an image where the cross was not either under the flag or somehow wrapped in the flag. And I, I was blown away because I kept searching and searching. I had to create my own image and make it a point to let the congregation know I created this because the cross is not the flag. The cross is over the flag. Mm -hmm. As Christians, we have to define ourselves as Christians first, you know, and, you know, if, if we don't do that, 
there's no way we're going to be able to love each other and have, you know, uh, be able to walk as Jesus intended. But it, it was amazing to me, to, you know, that just how in, in our society, that, that imagery, that mindset is just so counter to what I think Jesus would have. You know, one of the uh, perceptions when Jesus came mm-hmm. was that he was going to overthrow the Roman government. Right. Uh, and uh, put the disciples in important positions yeah, yeah. Uh, within the kingdom. <laughs> yes. A future kingdom, yes, mm-hmm. but that really wasn't the Lord's goal. Right. Um, so what do you say on, on that point yeah. about the founding of America and its, its biblical and Christian roots among many, even though they weren't all Christians, yeah. they all had a lean toward a yeah. belief in God and yeah. things. So with this nation, it was founded as a as a Christian nation, uh, what do you say to those people that, you know, hold the cross and the flag yeah. together? I, I, I think, you know, a lot like my dad, loved him, but um, he was a sinner for a long part of his life, right? Yeah. Just, yeah. Just, just like me, um, he, he did some things. I mean, when I look at the founding of the country on Christian values, all men are created equal, other than the slaves, right? You know, we, there's some contradictions. And I think the reality is, I think we, I'm, I'm so glad that we have a, a Christian foundation and morals in, in terms of the, 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 the overarching principles of the country, but we also have some deep contradictions that came with that as well. And I think both can be true. I mean, it's, it's just like me. I look at my life and I say, I wish I could be more Christ-like. I, you know, I walk away from some conversations you know, with my wife and say, you know, if I could be more like Jesus, we wouldn't be having this yeah, problem. Right, yeah. um, and, and I think you know, I have to just acknowledge that there are gaps in this flesh that, you know, that I do things that are, that are wrong. As long as I can repent, as long as I can, you know, continue to keep that before the Lord, yeah. we can grow and move together. And I think that's the same with this whole conversation is that it, we're not all one or the other. And mm-hmm. I think the reality is when we accept that we're, we're all messed up, <laughs> like, yeah. then we can actually, yeah. I think, come together and heal and walk together. And, and so, like, it's not my opinion. Right. Versus your opinion, right, right. Um, it's uh, bring the Lord into the middle of it and say, God, how do we bring some type of community together? Right. Uh, because culturally, um, you know, even musically, mm-hmm. um, a lot of African American uh, mm-hmm. music, it's great, mm-hmm. but it's different culturally right. from contemporary, some contemporary music or from hymns, right, <laughs> or, right, you know right, what I'm saying? This, that's, not, that's not a right or wrong, that's just right. a cultural thing. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, yep. and, and how we um, are thinking about one another, perceiving one another, um, would be helpful if um, we could, first of all, look at each other through the lens of Jesus. Right. Right. Um, and then ultimately, you know, when we talk about um, the nation, for instance, has really had two major spiritual awakenings. Mm-hmm. When you talk about the history of the country, mm-hmm. you have mid 1700s in New England, because that's the only part that America was at the time, mm-hmm. with Jonathan Edwards. Um, that la- persisted for a number of years, and it really shifted a community, mm-hmm. Sh- shifted the whole atmosphere of communities. Um, then with the Second Great Awakening, mm-hmm. um, you have Charles Finney mm-hmm. um, and some of these other individuals. Um, the Cane Ridge Revival started to move in toward the, uh, down to Kentucky and mm-hmm. things that shifted a nation. Then you have you know, 18, late 1850s, um, the prayer movement that started with Jeremiah Lanfear. Mm. that spread across the nation. It was a movement of prayer. Mm. Mm. Uh, it's called the Layman's Revival or the Prayer Revival. Mm. It shifted America. Um, and uh, it appears mm. that the only thing that has ever saved America and kept us, actually historical studies have shown mm. that the only thing that has saved the nation from going the way of Europe, mm. and we're, we're yeah. fast approaching a godless yes. Europe type of... Uh, atmosphere. Right. The only thing that's brought America back to its senses mm-hmm. has been spiritual awakenings. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, where God has intervened and shifted the culture back to himself. Right. And ultimately, 
um, if we're going to see something happen in America. I don't want to simplify it, but I don't want to complicate it either. Mm. We have to have something supernatural. Mm. A spiritual awakening. First of all, it gets a hold of the hearts of men because ultimately everything we're talking about here is a heart issue. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and and you know, out of the the issues of life, come out of the heart. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. They come out of the heart, and the only way that we're going to be able to have some sense of peace mm -hmm. is for a heart change. Yes, agree, agree, agree. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So, for those that are watching right now, if, if you could preach a 60 second sermon. Oh, wow. Um, which is difficult for preachers to do. And right? a black you, preacher, I can't do Yeah, 60 okay, you seconds. can't do that. You just can't do that. I get it. Okay. I could get a text out. Yeah, I can get a text out. Okay, if you're going to text somebody right now, and it's a three point sermon, four point, five point, ten point, whatever mm, it is. Mm. Um, based upon what we're seeing in America right now, because there's this going on, mm. tension here, then there's this tension over here, right. then there's this over here, and, right. um, and we're not getting anywhere mm. by yelling at people or calling people stupid idiots because of a governmental policy, right? right, right That's right. not going to get us anywhere. Mm -hmm. So mm. preach to us for a second mm, mm, mm. and bring us back to some sense of sense. <laughs> wow, wow. Man, 60 seconds. Okay, I, uh, I don't maybe know. Maybe 90 <laughs> seconds, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think that um, as Christians, as Christ followers, I, I think we have to come back to a sense of identity and, and purpose of who we are. And who, uh, You know, we were created in God's image and in his likeness, you know, in, in in, in part to love him and to reflect his image and to establish his kingdom on earth. And I think that um, the more we get, uh, give our attention and our focus to whether it be the news or whether it be, you know, what's happening outside, the more we can get distracted from that purpose, which, which by the way, I think is what the enemy wants sure. uh, more than yeah. anything else. And I, and I think that the only way we can as maintain a sense of direction and a, a sense of focus is, getting back into the Word, getting back into prayer, getting back into the presence of God, and getting back into what God has called us to do. Um, and, and recognizing though we, we live in the world, we're not of the world. And, and understanding that we have to make sure we keep his heart first, his mind first, and everything we do. Mm. So I'm sure I was over. See, you did minutes. it. Uh, you did it, okay. <laughs> I'm going to watch the time. Your, your church is watching, right? Okay, they're going to say, Pastor. <laughs> yeah. uh, Lawrence, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. This is this is good. I think it's this is a very important conversation, and I really appreciate just you know the opportunity to just talk and chat and these very comfortable chairs. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll uh, we'll talk again in these comfortable chairs. Awesome, awesome. Uh, because this this um, subject isn't going away. Right, right. Um, and uh, I believe that uh, you in your area where you're pastoring, you have a significant voice mm. because. Um, whether we realize it or not, um, people that are standing in front of people every week, um, even though there's there's a lot <laughs> that's influencing us. I mean, we got information coming from everywhere. Right. People really do want to hear, mm -hmm. is God saying something? Right. And He is. Yep. Yep. Um, he yep. is. So thank you for being here. Yep. No, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Tell your wife and kids uh, that you're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> You told me to listen to my wife years ago. She never allows me to forget. Yeah. That's the Mark said. <laughs> listen yeah. to you. <laughs> oh, I did. Wow. What was I thinking? So, so right. thanks for that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, thank you. And, and we're, we're honored that you have spent some time with us talking about race and Jesus in America. Would you go ahead and share this? Uh, like it, share it, uh, and uh, put your comments down. Let us know what you're thinking because we're having a conversation about this, and we're going to have more conversations about this. Uh, thanks for being with us on Midweek Talks, and we will see you again real soon.